Hi, I'm Masashi from CyberAgent, a company based in Tokyo. I belong to a research team AI Labo. We are doing research and applying machine learning technologies to various real world applications such as advertisement systems, AI voice bot, and various other domains as well. My GitHub account is C BATA. I'm a committer of Optuna Framework and a reviewer of Kubeflow Cartier project. I also published some Python and Go libraries, and they currently reach more than 6,000 GitHub stars in total. Please check it out. Today's topic is about ML Ops case studies in our company. While applying machine learning technologies into our products, we bumped some technical issues to build production class services. There are a lot of challenges. For example, in, ad in an advertisement system, it requires thorough performance tuning because there are strict limitations in real-time bidding. And also, there are challenges in terms of team skills. You know, machine learning engineers might not be experienced software engineers who can build production class services. So today, I'd like to share our knowledge how we build production class machine learning systems. The first case study is about how to accelerate a prediction server and how to build a memory efficient Python binding using CSON and NumPy C API. Our product, Dynalist, provides an advertisement system. In particular, this is a DSP product. You know, internet advertisement is based on auction called real time bidding. DSP is a short of demand side platform. DSP allows ad advertisers to buy impressions in real time. To buy impressions, we need to estimate the possibility of that users will take conversions on an advertiser's website. Conversion is such as purchasing some items or from an advertiser's smartphone application. We use FFM field level factorization machines to estimate these conversion rates. Field aware factorization machine is known as a powerful method, especially for CTR or CBR prediction. And it became winner solution of some competitions such as KDD Cup and Kaggle. LibFM is a C library written by the first author of the paper. This library provides a command line interface. And if you want to use this from Python, you can use third-party Python binding libraries. But we added some modifications to improve the performance by mitigating delayed feedback problem. Delayed feedback is a problem that means leveling some samples in training date. Imagine that we trained CBR models. In the production environment, we want to use the latest date for training a model so that the training data are corrected right before training. However, there is a relatively long time delay between a quick event and its conversion, so that some quick events are labeled as negative instance, even though it may reach conversion in, new, in a few hours later. This is a delayed feedback problem and well known in advertisement field. We address this issue by using an importance weight approach typically used for covariate shift correction. According to an online experiment, our method improves the accuracy of machine learning model. Our approach is accepted at Web Conference 2020. In terms of the development of LibFFM, we added some modification in the loss function of LibFFM. Due to these modifications, we cannot use third-party Python bindings. Of course, we can fork the third-party Python binding and use it, but there are some quality concerns in the source code. So we decided to build our own Python binding from scratch. And also, in real-time bidding, it determines the advertisement to show to users 
in real time. Therefore, the response must be returned within 100 milliseconds. Also, our DSP server receives hundreds of thousands of requests per second. So we need to not only we need to improve not only the accuracy, but also we need to improve the performance. We have two challenges. In a training stage, we need to implement our own Python binding of LibFM. And in a prediction stage, we need to implement high performance prediction server. We use CSON for both purposes. This is our system diagram. There are two main components, prediction server and machine learning pipeline. Machine learning pipeline is triggered periodically for continuous training. If it's triggered, get latest data set, train models, then upload to S3 on AWS. In the prediction stage, prediction server loads the trained models from S3 and uses it. CSON is an optimizing static compiler for both the Python language and CSON language. It makes writing C extensions for Python as easy as Python itself. The compiler is quite smart. In most cases, CSON program will be faster than my handwriting C extension code. As I'll talk about later, it can also be used to implement C++, C++ Python bindings. Usage is like this. The basic usage of CSON is to specify a static types in our Python code. But also we can release a global interpreter log for more performance tuning. If we specify a static types, the Python function will be replaced with C level code. Global interpreter log is a constraint of C Python. Due to this constraint, only one OS level thread that holds GIL can execute Python bytecode. So we can execute Python code in parallel on the processor core level, even if using multiple OS native threads. But again, this is a constraint of C, C Python. If Python C API is not used, and Python data structure isn't accessed, we can release global interpreter log explicitly like this. <clears throat> and also, we can use CSON compiler directives. Here, I introduce a compiler directive called C division. The division operation is performed on the fifth line, no, uh, 15th line of the code on the right. CSON has a compatibility with Python. So if the size, zero, size is zero, this code must throw a zero division error exception as the behavior of Python. But then we need to call the Python C API. So the semantics of division operation differs between C and Python. If we want C level code, we need to change its behavior. C division directive enables that. As a result of performance tuning, the latency and throughput is significantly improved. The prediction time is now 10% of the original code. The latency of the prediction server decreases 40% than before, and throughput is 1.35 times higher. Next, I'm going to talk about how to build a memory efficient Python binding using CSON and NumPy C API. As I said before, the CSON compiler is quite smart. So, accelerating Python programs is relatively easy. However, implementing Python bindings for the C library requires a deep understanding of CSON and C++ memory management. The overall code 
to rock C++ library is like this. It first initializes C++ structs by using pymemmalloc, that is a Python C API. By the way, we also use mmalloc function of libc, but pymemmalloc allocates a memory from the C Python heap memory, so the number of system call insurance can be redu reduced. It is more efficient to allocate a particularly small area, small memory buffer. After calling C++ function, which is declared by C def x term from keyword, we need to release a memory by pymem free function. The diagram shows uh, this diagram shows the uh, overall flow about how allocates and release memory buffer. The block on the left is a Python code, the middle block is a Python CSON code, and the right block is a C code. While coding Python function ehem dot train C++ function <laughs> train with validation is called by a CSON code. Inside the libfm code, the memory area of the weights array is allocated by the mlloc function of libc. Then wrap weights array by numpy c API and use it from Python. The memory buffer area of weights array is not released automatically, so we have to release it ourselves when Python object is released by garbage collector. Let's review Python's memory management mechanism. This is an example code that uses our own Python binding. By calling ffm.train Python function, libffm internally allocates weights array, then return model object. Model dot underscore weights properly property is numpy array that wraps C++ weights. We need to access it while the model is alive, but they allocate it in conjunction with Python's memory management mechanism. CPython has a mark sweep like garbage collector to solve the problem with the circular references, but CPython's memory management mechanism is based on the reference counting. So the object does not have references, it will be released immediately. To understand reference count more clearly, I printed reference count of model dot underscore weights object, that is numpy array. Please note that the reference count is displayed as two on the right, because um, it is incremented when calling sys dot get ref count function. So 2 is printed, but the reference count is actually 1. When decremented by del statement, the reference count turns into 0 so that the object model object will be released immediately. To release C++ array in conjunction with reference count, we need to know more about NumPy C API. Please check underscore train function. Model underscore PTR is a pointer to the libfm weight array allocated by libfm. Wrap this pointer as a NumPy array by calling a NumPy C API function, that is, pi array simple new from date. However, in order to release this memory buffer in conjunction with Python, we need to specify a base object by a pi array set base object. Please note that this numpy C API is called inside the cnp.set array base system function. A base object on the content of the numpy array. I prepared an object underscore weight underscore finalizer class as a, as a base object. This class releases C++ memory buffer when it is released from memory on CPython. By the way, 
If you want to write Python binding more easily, you can also generate a NumPy array in a Python, then copy to, then copy the weights into it, and immediately release the C++ weights. However, this this approach temporarily requires twice memory space, and requires waste CPU operations, waste to copy weights. In this way, we have implemented a memory efficient Python binding. The second topic is about hyperparameter optimization. In our product, the machine learning pipeline is triggered weekly. It trains machine learning models with the latest dataset. Because training dataset is changed every week, the best hyperparameters may change every week. The challenge is how we can exploit previous optimization history. Here is an illustration of how we transfer previous execution results for the current execution. We train the same machine learning models every week, and we optimize the hyperparameter search space same hyperparameter search space every week. The only difference is just the data distribution of training dataset. The best hyperparameter may be changed, but it is probably just slightly changed, not significantly, from the last week. So we can estimate the promising hyperparameter distributions from the previous execution results. We use Optuna and ML4 for this challenge. Optuna is a popular Python library for hyperparameter optimization. It is an easy to use and well designed. It also supports a wide variety of optimization algorithms. As I said before, I'm a committer of Optuna. And I'm an author of Optuna Web Dashboard. If you're using Optuna, please use the Web Dashboard as well. By using Web Dashboard, you, we can check not only the history of hyperparameter optimization, but also we can check hyperparameter importances and dependencies between hyperparameters. Getting back to about an algorithm, the default algorithm of Optuna is a univariate TPE. This is a Bayesian optimization method. It can achieve the good performance on average, but there are some limitations. For example, it does not consider dependencies of hyperparameters. In some cases, performance may be improved by considering dependencies of hyperparameters. I prepared an objective function like this. The landscape of this search space is shown in the figure. The horizontal axis of the figure is hyperparameter x, and the vertical axis is hyperparameter y. There are good hyperparameters in the lower left and the upper right of the search space. On the other hand, there is no good hyperparameters in the upper left and lower right. However, Optuna's default algorithm does not take dependencies into account, so it explores the upper left and lower right. There are some algorithms that can consider dependencies. From these algorithms, we selected CMAES. CMAES, Covariance Matrix Adaptation Evolution Strategy, is one of the most promising methods for black box optimization. Here is an algorithm, uh, here is an animation that illustrates how CMAES works. First, CMAES initializes a multivariate Gaussian distribution. The main vector of multivariate Gaussian distribution is located on the center of this figure. Next, CMAS samples some hyperparameters from the 
distribution. After evaluating them, the hyperparameters are sorted by objective values. Then updating the main vector and the covariance matrix based on the ranking of objective values. This method can consider dependencies between hyperparameters. CMAS is particularly useful when the evaluation budget is moderate to large. For example, roughly the number of hyperparameters times 100 evaluation budget is required. But we use CMAS and we extended CMAS algorithm for transfer line. <coughs> Warm starting CMAS is a transfer learning method for CMAES. It is proposed by Masahiro Nomura, he's my colleague, and accepted at AI 2021. I implemented this algorithm on Optuna and available from version 2.6.0. MLflow. MLflow is a platform for managing the machine learning lifecycle. We use it for two purposes. The first purpose is to manage parameters, metrics, and artifacts. The other purpose is versioning trained models. I won't describe details of MLflow here, but you can use it like the code. Here is an illustration of how Optuna and MLflow transfer previous execution results for the current execution. First, store Optuna's execution history in MLflow artifacts, then load it as next week. The code that integrates Optuna and MLflow looks like this. First of all, retrieve some retrieve source trials for wall starting CMAS. The details will be explained in the next slide. Then instantiate the CMAS sampler based on source trials. After evaluating hyperparameter optimization, after executing hyperparameter optimization, the execution history is saved in a SQL3 file. By uploading this file to MLflow artifacts, you will be able to see it at next next week. By calling MLflow client dot get latest version function, extracts the information or model used in production from the model registry of MLflow. Because the model information contains run information, we can access MLflow artifacts via it. As I described before, Optuna's execution history is in SQLite3 file. So retrieving SQLite3 file by a client dot download artifacts function. Then we can instantiate Optuna's RDB storage. We checked the performance of warm starting CMAS on the production environment. The left figure shows the result of univariate DPE, which is the default optimization method of Optuna. The right figure shows the result of warm starting CMAS, our proposed method. Even though AC values are private, these figures are enough to see the amount of improvements from the default hyperparameters. Unlike univariate TPEs, warm starting CMS has been able to find better hyperparameters than the default hyperparameters from the early trials. The last topic is about green threads and WebSocket. This is a case study while developing an AI voice board. The system architecture of AI voice board for phone calls is like this. When we have phone calls from users, 
Twilio connects to our WebSocket server. User's voice data is sent through the WebSocket connection. The system converts it into the text data, then our bot engine generates the response. The response, of our, the response of our bot engine is still text data. Therefore, we convert it to natural sounding speech using the Google Cloud Text to Speech API, then send it to users via WebSocket. This system is built by machine learning engineers. We built WebSocket servers in Python because our bot engine is also written in Python. But the development of WebSocket server is not easy. It's especially difficult to implement in Python. So machine learning engineer bumped a technical issue to implement WebSocket server. Here is a technical issue. Machine learning engineers tell me that our bot engine server, our WebSocket server works when started from the Python command, but it does not work on GUnicorn server. So please fix it. I need to fix uh, this complex bug on web, of WebSocket server. You know, as is generally known, machine learning engineer might not be experienced software engineers who can build product production class services. So I mentored and trained them. This topic is actually not related to machine ML ops directory. This is just about a case study of server-side development, but this is a useful topic for machine learning engineers who have to implement a server in Python. To understand this issue correctly, we need to have a good understanding of WSGI and green thread. WSGI is a short of web, web server gateway interface and is standardized by PEP3333. This is a common interface between web server and web application in Python. For example, Python has servers such as GUnicorn and UWSGI. These servers are compatible with WSGI interface, so they can run WSGI applications such as Flask, Bottle, and Django application. WSGI application is a callable object that accepts two arguments. The first argument is a WSGI environment that is a dictionary object that holds the request information. The second argument is a function to set the status code and response header. And the returned value is a response body. Because it's a function-like interface, it's difficult to implement bidirectional real-time communication protocol like WebSockets. We use Flask sockets, which is created by Kenneth Reads. This framework enables Flask to handle WebSocket connections. In Flask sockets, pre-instantiate WebSocket object is passed by a WSG environment, and it is retrieved inside Flask and use it. The thread that calls WSG application cannot be released until the communication is completed. To avoid to assign one thread, one OS native thread to each WebSocket connection, Flask sockets use green threads. For example, when using threading.thread, it is actually OS native thread. OS native threads have some disadvantages like this. First, the context switch of OS native thread is heavy. It needs to dump the register values to memory, then load register values of another thread from memory and execute it. This is a heavy operation. The another concern is the stack size. The stack size of OS native thread is large. For example, it is the fixed size 2 megabytes, even though it depends on the system. So something like a thread that runs in user land 
is required in some cases. In Flask sockets, G event WebSocket is used under the hood. So next, I'm going to describe the internal of G event WebSocket. As the name implies, G event WebSocket uses G event library, that is a grid thread implementation in Python. I have prepared the call to call time.strip function twice to explain G event. In this call, we use threading.thread. .thread. As I said before, this is a OS native thread. Then call time.strip function twice. So the two threads are processed in parallel and each thread sleep for five seconds. So the total execution time is also around five seconds. We can check how thread works via the concurrency diagram on PyCharm like this. This shows spawn two, plus two threads and concurrently executed. So let's use the G event. The first two lines are replaced to use G event library. The first, the first line is imports G event dot monkey. The next line calls monkey dot patch all function. As PyCharm's concurrency diagram shows, there is only one thread. Nevertheless, the total execution time is just over five seconds, even though we call time dot sleep five seconds twice. I'm gonna describe what first two lines do. The first two lines calls monkey patch. This replaces all blocking operation in standard libraries. For example, time.sleep function calls sleep system call. This is a blocking operation. So that g event monkey patch replaces it with g event.sleep function. This is a g event on implementation of time.sleep. And, and of course, it is a non blocking operation. Furthermore, OS native thread is replaced with green threads. The implementation of threading.thread is replaced by G event on green thread implementation. This is, it is G event dot green thread class. So this program executed time.strip concurrently on one thread. This is how G event works. G event WebSocket handles WebSocket connection with green threads in this way. Here is an internal code of G Unicorn's G event worker. As this code do, G event monkey patch is applied after process is spawned. Then allocate is green red G event green threads pool, then call with the application on one green thread. But basically, G event can replace all blocking operations in standard library. If the third party library implements blocking operation, G event cannot replace it by default. In our product, we use Google's speech to text API and text to speech API. It uses gRPC by directional streaming RPC under the hood. It is a blocking operation. This is why our WebSocket server does not work correctly. To resolve this issue, we just call 
G Event Monkey Patch that is provided by GRPC library. Let me summarize this talk. In this talk, I shared our knowledge around MLOps. In the first case study, I show how to performance, how to optimize a prediction server using Python, and how to build a memory efficient Python binding of C++ library. In the second case study, I'll show you how to implement a transfer learning method for hyperparameter optimization using Optuna and MLflow. And the last case study, I describe the internal of WSGI and G Event WebSocket and how WebSocket servers work on WSGI protocols.